Hi, everybody. This is not on. Yes, it is. Awesome. All right. All oh, right. I need to give a mic to you guys. Sorry. OK. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. So we have the coveted right before lunch running 15 minutes behind spot. But I like to think that we are the most anticipated session of this morning. She so everybody's willing to wait. Can't, can't hear you. you can't hear me. Uh, How about this one? Better? Can you hear this? Let's share. <laughs> this was on. All right. I can just yell. <laughs> Perfect. So my name's Sarah Waldner. I'm a product manager at GitLab. Uh, I work on our, yes. To my mouth. There we go. Troubleshooting. Uh, I work on our monitoring product. So as Priyanka introduced, uh, we're going to take a look at multi-cloud from the provider's perspective, but I'm going to give everyone a chance to introduce themselves first. Uh, my name is Vic Iglesias. I'm a senior staff solutions architect with Google. Uh, I'm Jason McGee. I run cloud platform for IBM. Uh, Bill Shetty, director of uh, developer advocacy for multi-cloud at VMware. And hi, I'm Bob Quillen, a VP DevRel for Oracle Cloud. So we spent majority of the morning hearing about the multi-cloud verse, the challenges, where we're headed, the obvious value proposition. This is a, a critical part as enterprises grow, acquire different companies. How are they going to approach it? So the discussion today is going to take a peek into this from the provider's perspective. Is this a threat? Do they see it as an opportunity? Um, I bet everyone says opportunity, but we'll see. And their advice when giving um, how end users should craft their strategy. So with that, first question to you guys is threat or opportunity? I can start off with opportunity for all the folks in the room, the users. Um, you know, this is, this is a, a chance for the cloud providers to, you know, fight for your business. And I think that's really helpful for, for you folks. Uh, it is also, I think, an opportunity for Google and the likes of companies that are investing in Kubernetes to make that, you know, universal substrate for multi-cloud operations. Yeah, so it, it do you want to go on? No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, no, it's definitely an opportunity, and, 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 and like we just heard, I mean, I, I look at it from a perspective that it is um, your opportunity to arbitrate between these clouds for the first time ever, right? Um, when back in the data center days, right, and building out your data centers, if you ever guys ever did that, and when the heydays when vendors came out, right, you pitted them against each other to effectively figure out how to get the best price and feature set, right? We are now at a stage in the multi-cloud kind of verse, I guess, as we're calling it, um, where we now have abstractions with Kubernetes and others that you can now have an ability to pit one against another to get those price points and feature sets. So it's a great opportunity for you guys. Uh, I, I guess my twist on it is uh, it's just inevitable. Like, I mean, the history of IT is not, uh, as much as any vendor would love to say, like, we're going to take over the whole world and everyone's going to run on our stuff, it never plays out that way. Uh, and the cloud era is no reason for that to be different. And you guys are going to use multiple providers. The different providers are good at some things and not good at other things. Like, we have strengths and weaknesses. Um, and multi-cloud allows you to play and leverage those strengths and avoid the weaknesses and kind of solve the problems that you really have, right? So I just think it's an inevitability that we get here. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. It's a, it's a reality today, especially as you kind of look at the maturity model we talked about this morning. Um, everyone's on that spectrum somewhere, and I think every customer I've ever talked to has got multiple clouds running. If you run in, you bring in the SaaS providers they're using, there's multiple clouds that are in every enterprise. Uh, every enterprise has always had partners and a stack of solutions they use. Uh, for different use cases, and I think as the, uh, the the technology continues to mature and all this infrastructure continues to grow to enable more multi-clouds, you have true workflow portability and app portability and all those uh, nice sort of up the continuum of, of the maturity model, I think you'll get there. Um, but right now, it's, it's true. Everyone is using multiple clouds. Now, the next, next chance is where it's going from there. So on that topic, uh, workload portability, data portability. As, as a product person, I see that there would be opportunity for providers to potentially partner together to create a more streamlined experience um, for the end user. Right now, everybody's kind of picking and choosing and building their own strategy. Uh, ha have any of you considered that? Well, well I'll jump in. Um, you know, we just announced a uh, integration with uh, Microsoft Azure, so Oracle Cloud and Azure integration. Uh, and, you know, 
while we're waiting for the technology uh, around cloud native to kind of mature and create all these inroads and on ramps and bridges to cross multiple cloud, I think these pairwise integrations will start where we have you know, guaranteed interconnect between data centers. We've got a unified identity model with single sign-on. Uh, you have uh, standardized applications that are um, you know, built for with partners. We have a shared uh, support model. So, you know, while we wait for the, the market to come together, I think you will see these pairwise and three-way kind of integrations happen until full standardization happens. But you know, I think that's a start. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, VMware, we are looking at this in a very interesting way, which is we realize that our customers are going to be on a spectrum, right? They're going to be either completely on-prem, and some will stay there, or some will go completely multi-cloud, public cloud. Some place in the middle is where you're going to land, right? Um, or maybe on one of those two vectors. At the end of the day, our um, strategy here is to give you guys choice where to land on that, on that spectrum. In order to do that, we're doing multiple things, right? One of the things that, and you've probably seen the announcements, we definitely, from the infrastructure level, if you're on-prem and you're trying to move out, giving you the opportunity to actually have consistent operations with uh, vSphere on Amazon or Azure or Google, right? And then if you wanted that portability or if you wanted an ability to take your applications out to start migrating them and have that as, as we're at KubeCon, we, we have you know, products like Tomzu and some other stuff. And finally, I think that the biggest thing that we've invested in, 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 in with integrations is really to give you a consistent set of operations around multi-cloud, right? Um, whether or not you pick one or another, there's multiple abstractions, and we are looking at how to actually help you manage that both on public and private. So the, the end goal is not just the integrations, but it's also a choice for you guys to be able to get what you want from an operational perspective. I mean, to go back to your original question on kind of how we are working together, I mean, I think the fact that there's, I don't know, how many people are here this week? Well over 10,000? 30,000. 30,000? Wow, I was going to say, that was a lot bigger than I was expecting. Um, uh, you know, the fact that there's so many people here is, I think, a sign that we have all been actually collaborating together um, in open source for five uh, plus years, at least in the cloud native space. I mean, many more years than that in other domains. Um, and that, you know, we've all actually been working together to build this platform. I'm actually pretty excited about it. My personal history, I, I spent kind of the first half of my career doing Java and app servers and kind of working in that era of computing. And back then, you know, we all worked together to write like this giant document, this big spec, and then we all went off and implemented the spec, and then we tested whether it all worked the same way, which of course it never did. Um, Today, we, we kind of solve these problems in a much different way, right? We actually build code together. And, and the tension I think you sometimes see between vendors, whether they're software vendors or cloud vendors, is, okay, there's an edge above that hasn't been done yet in open that we're all trying to glue together, wire together, make easy. And, but below that, there's this constant evolution that we're, we're making the projects better, we're solving problems in a more consistent way, and that's, I think, good for everybody that we're, you know, we, I think for the first time that I've seen in 20 plus years in IT, we have one platform in Kubernetes that literally everybody agrees is the runtime platform we're going to go build on. So. Yeah, and I think the, the nice thing is that it's a collaboration between users, like people who are just part of the community and want to start using it. You're placing your bets uh, along with all of the providers, uh, and then eventually we're co converging. I think three years ago, Kubernetes was not you know, the ubiquitous thing. We've all landed there now, and we're moving forward on that decision. So it's kind of interesting to have all the users and providers kind of betting together, uh, and eventually a, a winner comes up. So we are at KubeCon. Um, how do you think open source, what role do you think open source plays in developing or evolving multi-cloud strategies for different enterprises? I, I'll, I just said what I thought right there. It's, yeah. it's all of us being in the room together and choosing together. So. Um, I mean, there's the obvious technical alignment piece of it, which I think most people probably get. I, one of the other dimensions I think is interesting about open source is uh, skills. You know, like I, I talk to lots of enterprises, and as a as a technology company, you know, the the people that I have on my teams. Um, I, I have a lot of clients who would love to be able to hire talent like that on their teams, right? Because, you know, they, it's hard to get these skills. And I think open source and these common platforms we're building also allow companies to build skill that works across all of us, that works across all these environments. And it's therefore much easier for them to kind of build a workforce that can go fast and stuff. So, like, sometimes I think from a user perspective, that's an unseen benefit of us all working in open source is we're all building the same skill base in the industry. 
Yeah, um, you, know, you said it best, I think, in, in the earlier question, right? I mean, I think open source is effectively good for us, right? It, it gives us the ability to you know, all contribute and get the consistency that we need from the APIs, from the abstraction levels, and uh, without it, I, I don't think we would be able to achieve where we want to get to in multi-cloud, which is, you know, as, as some of the, the first questions, really to get to that level of homogeneity, right, across multiple clouds, right? You want to be able to pick. And the only way to do this is to allow us here, like KubeCon is a perfect example of just contributing and getting into it, right, and, and, and starting to contribute and, and, and bring up potential issues and ideas to build on, right, that you're seeing. Um, it, it's a constantly evolving process, right? There's no endpoint here necessarily. Yeah, it is no doubt the, the catalyst for the multi-cloud future that we're going to. There's, there's no doubt that without open source, we're not going to get there together, and we're going to continue to build the proprietary services that are you know, vertically integrated versus kind of horizontally integrated. And so I think there's, a, it, there's work to be done and to fill in a lot of the gaps to bring people forward on the culture side um, and kind of get them through the training process and to connect and bring over all these existing enterprise applications it's hard work to migrate, especially a running application. And we're seeing more and more tools and techniques and uh, you know, some presentations even today around how to uh, enable, what are, the, what are the gotchas, what are the lessons learned, of how, how you do these migrations to a multi-cloud world, so. Can I add maybe one counterpoint? Yeah, on absolutely. Open source? Um, the one thing I think open source is sometimes not as good at is baking kind of operational knowledge into the code. Like open source projects tend to be, and I know it's a blanket statement, but like they tend to be really good at kind of feature capability and kind of iterating on capability. And then we all leave like, how do I actually stand this up and run it as something else? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really interesting area where there's a ton of activity going on. And I know as it's, certainly as a public cloud provider, and I see this in, in Anthos as well, and the work we're doing in multi-cluster management at IBM, like, Taking the operational experience, you know, like at IBM, I run the our Kubernetes service. We have like twenty plus thousand Kube clusters that we're running. Like taking the knowledge of running twenty thousand clusters and baking it into the environment is super valuable. And like where a place where open source, it takes a lot longer for that to kind of work its way in. Right. Did you want to add to that? No, I'll leave that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a number of times this morning before the panel, we touched on uh, acquisition as often a driver or kind of the catalyst behind a particular enterprise or company becoming multi-cloud. Um, and I'm curious for the audience, are there proactive steps uh, that an enterprise can take, tools or different tool chains that they would want to invest in that perhaps are better suited to multiple clouds than others? I think one, one thing is that uh, all abstractions are bad, uh, some are useful. Um, so eventually you have to choose some abstraction that you're gonna have for your multi-cloud days. Um, you know, we see things like control plane and other places like just choosing Kubernetes as the abstraction you're gonna have. Starting to figure out what that abstraction is gonna be, a lot of us in this room have probably chosen Kubernetes, maybe thinking about a layer up uh, on your roadmap of how you're gonna choose your abstraction if and when uh, you land in a multi-cloud scenario so that you're kind of prepared for those situations. Yeah, and uh, that's one aspect, absolutely. And, uh, and I think as you're, as you're buying other companies and you're trying to merge these different environments and, and cultures at the same time together, right, it's, it's a little bit of a, obviously it's a mess. But I think w one of the best pieces of advice is understand what your end goal is, right, and how you want to use, let's say, multi-cloud. Maybe they're on a different cloud. The important aspect here is, is as you get into that and you have multiple semantics that you're now starting to deal with, maybe you're on Amazon and somebody that you bought is, let's say, Azure at the end of the day, right? Um, the first thing you want to do is to really ensure as an organization that you have the expertise and the skill sets to kind of manage that multiple sets of semantics, right? Because it is not just about having silos. You're going to want to have to be able to work together. And so having a unified, I would say, an operational team that manages a multi-cloud environment it doesn't have to be Kubernetes only, right? This is about understanding like RBAC and IAM models across multiple clouds, which are a mess, right? And they all have their different components. Getting that knowledge and skill set started is important by far, you know, in the beginning, right? As you do that. And then secondly is understanding, I think, in, in my viewpoint, is getting the observability tools that are required and not just obviously at the Kubernetes level, but also at the cloud level and marry the two. 
and understand what you're going to use. You may use Kubernetes, you may use you know Lambda. You, you know, understand all the variants. And finally, I, you know, understand your process, right? <laughs> of how you are going to manage that new uh, addition, right? You leave it alone, and 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 it's a slow process. But understanding the process and how that maybe melds or merges in is going to be important. And as you understand your process, you can constantly iterate. So it's it takes a bit of work. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I, I, I agree with both of those comments. I, I guess what I would add is the thing I try to work on a lot with my teams, and I talk to clients a lot about, is just velocity. Like one of the ways to prepare for acquisitions, new things coming in, something being different, is to really focus your team on like how you deliver with speed and like react to change quickly. Um, don't get caught up in the like we're going to pick the perfect platform and define like all the attributes of it and make all these strategic decisions and then we'll just put everything in it because by the time you're done with that process like half your decisions are probably wrong and so you really have to like figure out how to get um high developer velocity because then yeah. you're just more able to deal with the change and it's interesting i think one of the things that's in the whole kind of kubernetes microservices space i think we have this like built-in assumption that you're good at devops like you're good at delivery an integration and the reality of the market is many people are not very good at it like we just kind of assumed that they were good at it and then all these cool things we built will be great you have to like put effort i think into that like put effort into figuring out how to do rapid delivery and then you'll just kind of be able to adjust course as you go i'll just add one one more thing that kubernetes is not going to solve your devops problem <laughs> uh, yeah i i yeah and and, and i want to just reiterate what you just said i mean you know, Think about the velocity and change that's occurring on the cloud itself right now, right? The number of features that Amazon releases and the number of capabilities and, and deltas that are occurring. Whatever process, forget about tools. I, I totally agree with them. Understand your process. Know where your SLAs are, what you want to achieve, and wrap yourself around that first before you start picking stuff. Because you, you're going to pick, you may change it in a year, what you pick as a tool, but you want to know what you want to achieve. Yeah, I, I would just add on setting setting standards and kind of architectural models as early as possible, not allowing things to fester. I think uh, even internally inside Oracle, you can imagine thousands of thousands of development teams, tens of thousands of developers, you know, many different clouds being used over the last 10 years and platforms, et cetera. We have consolidated a lot of that in some standard models and, and achieved a lot more velocity by having at least some top-down uh, push of standards and, and moving to those you know, it was kind of a late move and in the jungle developed and took a long time to prune that back. So I think the sooner you set those and enforce them top down, you know, the more able I think you are to move quickly uh, without having, uh, you know, these pockets of, of uh, abstractions happening all around you, so. Awesome, thank you gentlemen. So I think that we have about five minutes left and I wanted to give all of you the opportunity to ask for any last pieces of advice or the burning questions you've had before we go to lunch. You said for us, so I'll take it. <laughs> take it and run. <laughs> comment about uh, the cost of being multi-cloud. I mean, I come from an academic environment, but we spent the last five years being multi-cloud due to the academic environments, and it's cost us at least two years. Uh, Sorry, what? It, it's cost you what? At least two years. Two years of lost time. Time, okay. Is that a question? Or I mean, can you comment on, like, can you comment on uh, the amount of time you think it takes uh, to be multi-cloud, and, and is it ultimately worth it? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I can just say five years ago, it would have been much, much more difficult yeah. than it is today. True. I think, yeah. like I said before, we're we're getting useful abstractions now that can, if you started today, it would not be a, a five-year journey with two years lost. I think it would be a, a much better ratio. Uh, and I think it is like like you said, you, you got to just start choosing an abstraction and then going down the road, being agile in how you kind of leverage that and make sure that there is some pluggability there in case you have to make a you know a change later down the road. But a lot of the stuff that that we mentioned before is different today than it was five years ago or even two years ago, for that matter. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. I, I also think, I don't know many people who sit down and go, okay, today I'm gonna figure out how to be multi-cloud. Like, it kind of happens, um, which maybe isn't a great thing, but that's kind of how it happens. Like, people just wind up being multi-cloud. And in a lot of cases, I find it, it starts in kind of isolated pockets, like this team, this 
business line, whatever, picked one thing and somebody else picked something else. Like, I, as a cloud provider, I love reading articles where it's like, so-and-so customer is a Google Cloud customer or a Microsoft Azure customer. Mike, every one of us can publish that article about the same person because some part of that company is using us. Um, so it, it, it kind of just happens and it's really kind of working backwards. I'm like, all right, now how do I drive some consistency across them? I think one of the hidden costs of multi-cloud is you have to be a little bit more intentional about what you run where and what the interactions are between things. Like I was having a meeting with a European um, insurance company and they were telling me about this one workload that they have and it runs on IBM Cloud, on Azure and on AWS. And in kind of one cycle of the data, it bounces back and forth between all three providers three times each. Like in, out, in, out, in, out. And I mean, one, I can't imagine what the performance is of that, but two, like think about egress charges and all the kind of actual cloud costs that goes into that. So like once you're good at multi-cloud, you can be too good at it and you actually have to start to put some structure in to put some sanity in. And I think data is often the center of gravity that kind of leads you to these apps go here and those apps go there. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, it, it, it gets better and it's getting better and that's why we're here today. Um, I don't think the tooling was there two years ago I mean, even for a single cloud, it was hard. Uh, for multi-cloud, I think we're, we're still um, some different platforms away, some more maturity away, um, but people are addressing the problems now, and I think it's, we'll see it improve much more over the last next two years, I think. So. Yeah, no, these are all great comments. I think the only thing, other piece of advice I'd give you is, is as you, it, it just kind of happens, right? I mean, it, it will happen. One of the things to always remember is to understand what the services are that you are going to allow your end users to use and to have a handle on some of that, right? In some cases, it may run away from you and you may not want that, right? And so having a little bit more of a tighter control around the costs and the utilizations, right, and the type and components that you're going to allow them to use, well, I'm not, not gonna say it's gonna completely solve your problems, but it's definitely gonna start mitigating some of that, right? Um, but it, and it's always changing, right? So even it to spend two years and it, there's probably new things that are going to come about and it, there's always a process here that's going to continually change, so. One yeah, more. that's, it sounds like you were, when everybody else was just starting lift and shift is when you were going multi-cloud. It's like trailblazers often traverse uncharted territories. So hopefully you learn more than other people though. <laughs> <laughs> other questions? Oh yeah, all right. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that Kubernetes kind of allowed this whole multi-cloud thing to become smoother. What do you think is still the biggest missing piece in, in going forward with that? Storage and networking. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the two hardest pieces. So, okay, so, so definitely storage, right, or databases, right? Let's just talk about state information. The, the other one is, okay, networking, I'll leave that there, absolutely. But I think that IAM integration from the multi-cloud kind of models back into Kubernetes RBACs and having some sort of consistency is the biggest problem right now. It goes back to policy management, right? And, and just having that level of consistency it goes to control, right? That's not there. Uh, I don't know when we'll get it. No? Uh, I kind of had, um, is, is there any like plans in the work or software in the work that you guys have to kind of address that? Yeah, well, I think we've seen a, a few people it's, trying it's to address it. You know, VMware and Google are. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, from a, uh, we talk about vendor, you know, vendor relationships, you know, Oracle's working with VMware on this kind of stuff. Uh, we work with Azure on this kind of stuff to get, work on the identity issues, to work on the partner, the you know, partner, the, the ecosystem around that, the support around that. Um, so I think there's this work that's being done um, at the open source level, at the standardization level, um, you're seeing products emerge that create um, a nice you know, unified platform, a unified control plane. We've heard some discussion of that today. Those are all positive developments. Those are early, uh, but that's kind of what's needed to kind of lift the market up to the next level, I think. So. All right. Yeah, all right, guys. Thank you so much. I think it's time for lunch. Yes. Ooh.